Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody this morning. We'll give everybody a chance to get settled in and we'll get started. We have several of our number that are out sick today. I got a message this morning from Katie Miller that she had uh, been up sick most of the night and so they wouldn't be here this morning. So we need to keep Katie in our prayers and of course during the summertime we typically always have people that are traveling so we need to remember all of them in our prayers also if you would go ahead and be opening your bibles to acts chapter one acts chapter one and this morning we're going to begin in verse 21 acts chapter one Verse 21. Jared, would you lead us in prayer, please? Last Sunday morning, we noticed from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 20, where the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. There they had just witnessed the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. The Mount of Olives, I want to share just a little bit of additional information on that before, uh, before we get into our study for this morning. The Mount of Olives was located just outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem, as you went out of Jerusalem, there was a small valley on one side of the city. That valley is still uh, known by this name today, known as the Kidron Valley. And in order to get to the Mount of Olives, you had to go through the Kidron Valley, and immediately you would start up the side of the Mount of Olives. We remember when Jesus was making his final entrance into Jerusalem. Remember it talks about how he came to the side of the Mount of Olives and he looked out upon the city of Jerusalem and that's when he made that statement that 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 so sad statement oh Jerusalem Jerusalem how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her babies or gathers her chicks under her wings the Mount of Olives was a significant location for Jesus because also on the side of the Mount of Olives was the location of the Garden of Gethsemane and so this was where he would have gone uh, the night that he was betrayed. So on the Mount of Olives was where he had gone along with the disciples, and this was the location where he would ascend back into heaven. Now the exact location on the Mount of Olives where the ascension took place is not well known, uh, but we do know that it had to have been within about seven-eighths of a mile from the place that the disciples were staying in the city of Jerusalem. And the way that we know that is because you may remember last week, it talked about the fact that they returned to Jerusalem from Olivet or from the Mount of Olives, which was about a Sabbath day's journey. Now, a Sabbath day's journey, whenever you go back, and of course the way that it was initially set forth was in Hebrew terms of, of, of measurement, but by anyone's best estimation, a Sabbath day's journey was less than a mile. It was about seven-eighths of a mile was all that a person was allowed to travel on the Sabbath day. So we see that this location was not far from the city of Jerusalem. And of course, whenever we look at maps, we look at geography of the area, we see that the Mount of Olives was very close and so certainly this uh, fits the bill of being the location where the ascension would have taken place. Well, up until the year 312 A.D., it was believed that the ascension took place just outside of a small cave 
that was located on the side of the Mount of Olives. And in fact, uh, up until 312 A.D., there are some sources that say that Christians actually would meet in that cave. That they that would be one of the places that they would come together to worship. Well, about the year 384, something very prominent took place. A man by the name of Constantine became the Roman emperor. And Constantine, not necessarily because he was an adherent to Christianity, but for political reasons, declared Christianity to be the state religion of Rome. And they went into Jerusalem, the Romans did, and they started trying to pinpoint all of these sites of significance. All of the places that had any type of of direct application to the life of Jesus. And they went in and they began to build these large structures, these large churches over the sites of these places of prominence. Well, one of the locations that they wanted to find was the place where Jesus had ascended. Well, they went to Jerusalem and some of the local Christians there took them and showed them this cave and and the Romans saw this and they they said, you know, this location, it's not prominent enough. It's not significant enough. And so they began to look around on the Mount of Olives to try to find a place that they thought in their mind was more fitting or more, uh, more applicable to the significance of the event of the ascension. So near the top of the Mount of Olives, they found a place where uh, there was a large rock that was sticking out of the ground and they accepted this spot, not necessarily based upon any type of fact, but they established this spot as where Jesus ascended. And they said that this rock was the very last place on planet Earth where Jesus had set foot. Now, as I said, the reason they chose this spot was not because That's where the Christians in Jerusalem said that the ascension had taken place, but it was because they were looking for a more significant location, a place where they could build this grand structure. Well, after this building was built, in 614, Muslims came in and occupied the land where Jerusalem is located, And one of the first things that they did was begin trying to strike down any semblance of Christianity. And so they went in and they completely destroyed this first structure that was built on the Mount of Olives uh, as a memorial or a testament to the ascension of Jesus. Well, just a few years later, the Crusaders from Europe came in, drove the Muslims out, they went in and they built this structure back bigger and better than it had been before. Well, then... It wasn't much longer after that, the Muslim armies all uh, combined together again under the leadership of Saladin, a name that you may have heard before. And he came in and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, occupied that place. But something that's interesting, and no historian has ever been able to give a good explanation for why. Unlike the first time when the Muslim armies came in and tried to destroy every semblance of Christianity. This time, when they came in under Saladin, they tried to preserve much of that history. Um, And and one of the sites, and this is something that I found interesting, I've been watching some videos that some of our brethren have put out um, talking about some of these locations over in uh, the Middle East and the Bible lands that have these um, significant ties to Christ. And there in the city of Jerusalem, there are a few locations that no one knows why they weren't destroyed. Uh, You have what's commonly referred to as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was built over what is generally believed to be the tomb of Jesus. It was not destroyed. And in fact, to this day, that location is controlled by Muslims. It is preserved by Muslims but they allow anybody that wants to visit access to it. This location that we're talking about here on the Mount of Olives, as I said, the Crusaders came in and they built this huge structure. 
But on this area where this rock was located, they built kind of a separate chapel. It was an octagonal shape, 12 by 12, wasn't very large at all. But the Muslim army came in and destroyed everything but that little chapel. And that's the only thing that still exists there to this day. Well, many people look at that and they say, well, that was the providence of God at work. God did not want these sites to be desecrated. God did not want these sites to be destroyed. But I find this very hard to believe. I find this hard to rationalize that belief because we never see any kind of of implication whatsoever that God ever intended any site on earth to become a place of pilgrimage or a place of honor. Never once do we see God saying, you know what, go out to Golgotha and build a shrine on this location. Go to the tomb of Jesus and build a structure over this location and go there and worship in these locations. We don't see any of that whatsoever. We don't see any type of connection being made to our worship to God being tied to a location. Well, that kind of set things apart a little bit more from Judaism, didn't it? Dad? Uh, I was reading that uh, today the Mount of Olives is used as a Jewish cemetery. It has been for over 3,000 years and holds 150,000 graves. Uh, It is uh, used as a burial location for Jews since biblical times, including the burial location for some of the most prominent biblical kings. I didn't didn't know that part of it. I had read somewhere that um, the Garden of Gethsemane was actually uh, located within... uh, what we would refer to as a cemetery or an ancient burial uh, burial area. But looking at this, as I was saying, folks, as those who are followers of Christ, our worship is not tied to a location. What did the Jews have to do? Well, they had to go to the temple or they had to go to the synagogue. That's where they went. That's where their worship was to take place. We think about other religions of the world. Those who practice the religion of Islam, in order for their worship to actually be considered worship, you know, they separate their their daily prayers from their worship, they actually have to come together in the mosque in order for that to be considered acceptable worship to their god. Uh, Many of the false gods that we see practiced by Hinduism, they say you have to actually go to their temple in order for that to take place. Folks, in order for our worship to God to be acceptable, does it have to be in this building? No. No, it does not. New Testament Christians did come together someplace, though. They did. New Testament Christians came together. You know, the concept of worship was never intended to be something that a person did solo. It was never intended to be something that we tried to go at alone. There was always this concept of coming together. Now, that's not to say that, you know, you think about uh, the early days of the Jerusalem church. You know, we read about about 3,000 being baptized at one time on that first day. A couple chapters later, we see that that number has risen to over 5,000. Now, there's nothing to indicate that all 5,000 of those people came together in the same place on the Lord's day to worship. I'm sure that they were meeting in each other's homes. They were meeting in upper rooms. They were meeting wherever they could find adequate space. During times of persecution, they would meet in tombs. They would meet uh, in caves, wherever they could find in order to meet. You know, we, if something were to happen to this building, you know, we could put a tent up out here on the parking lot. We could go around to people's homes. We could, uh, there's any number of things that could be done because our worship is not tied to a location. And so whenever we think about what we see and what I'm talking about here, you know, that, that kind of stands to reason that this would not have been the purpose for those structures being built. But also another incident, and I promise we're going to get through this and actually get into the text, but I thought this kind of give uh, a little bit more meaning to the things we've been talking about. 
But another incident that led many early Christians to believe that the site of the Ascension was a holy place took place during the construction of one of these structures. You remember I told you that there was this large rock that was jutting out from the ground that they believed to be the place where Jesus had actually last stood. Well, as they were building this structure, they were going in laying marble slabs down on the floor. And every time that they would lay one of these slabs down over this stone, they would come in the next day and the stone would be broken. Then they came in one day and the way that it was explained, it said that it was burst into tiny bits. And so they looked at this and rather than considering the fact that Jerusalem is built upon a major fault line, that there are frequent earthquakes, the ground is always moving, and plus anyone that has ever done any kind of work with tile or stone or anything like that, you know that if you place stone on top of stone, whatever the softer stone is, is going to break. It just doesn't work. Well, on this occasion where they came in and it looked like essentially the stone had exploded, they moved it all away, and when they looked at the stone underneath, it had a marking on this stone that they claimed, and of course this marking's not there anymore, but they claimed that it looked like the shape of human feet. And so they took that as an indication, they took that as this was a miraculous revealing that we need to consider this a holy place. Well, as I said, this really doesn't pertain much to the study, but this is the location we're talking about, the things that were going on. So getting back to the text, the disciples have been there. They've just witnessed Jesus' ascension back into heaven. Uh, the angels have reiterated on this occasion that just as Jesus had told them that he was coming back, that he would be coming back in the same way that they had saw him go. But then in keeping with the directions or the instructions that Jesus had given to them, they went back to Jerusalem. You remember he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait until the coming of the Holy Spirit. So they go back to Jerusalem, and once the 11 remaining apostles and 109 others, you know, the text says that there were 120 people there, so you have 11 apostles and 109 other disciples. They come together. Peter stands up and he begins to proclaim to them some more graphic details about the death of Judas. And he reveals that much of this was in fulfillment of prophecy. But one of the prophecies that had to be fulfilled was that Judas' position among the 12 had to be replaced. Now, something to keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more as we move further into the book of Acts, but I want you to notice there's only one time that we read about an apostle actually being replaced. Judas, we're told he gave up that position, gave up that authority that he had in order to deny Christ. He gave that up. And referring back to Psalm 109 and verse 8, this is the prophecy that we see being set forth. It reveals that it was God's intention all along for another disciple to be chosen to take Judas' place. And I want you to notice, notice there in verse 20, it says, For it is written, this is Acts chapter 1, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Well, in the King James Version, we find a word that is not found in any other English translation. The word bishopric. Well, this is used in reference to the position that Judas had held. But I got curious, and I've got a... A program on my computer that has about 25 or 30 of the more uh, more prominent English translations. You know, the King James Version is the only one that translates this word as bishopric. Well, the term bishop eventually came to be interchangeable with the terms elder, pastor, shepherd, 
and overseer, which they all refer to the same position, the spiritual leader of a congregation. But each of these Greek terms that are translated in these different ways have different meanings, and they refer to different aspects of that position. Well, at least initially, everyone understood that these terms were to be used interchangeably, that these were descriptive terms, that these were not necessarily titles, but they were descriptions of these men holding the position of elders in the church. But as the church began to apostatize, at least um, as early as the end of the first century, they came to use this term bishop to be a more high and exalted position. No longer was it seen as a term that was interchangeable with these other references, but it came to be used as a term signifying someone higher up in uh, the church hierarchy, meaning they were a higher ranking member of the church. Well, and of course, as the church continued to apostatize into what became the Roman Catholic Church, they took the Greek term. Um, and, and the Greek term, and I've told you many times, I try not to ever uh, mention actual Greek terms because it's not something that really applies much. But in this sense, we find the Greek term episkopos. Episkopos is the term that came to be translated when it was translated into English. It came to be translated as bishop. Well, it was erroneously applied to higher ranking members within the church hierarchy. Yes, they still saw elders in the local church. Yes, they still saw deacons in the local church. But what came to take place, what came to be was that they would appoint one man to be over all of the churches in a geographical area. And they gave him a more exalted title. They came to refer to him as the bishop. We still see that in some religious groups today. But among those, especially in the Catholic Church, they believe that their bishops are the actual descendants, or at least their authority, has directly descended from the apostles. And that authority continues to this day through that position of bishops. But, as I said, you look at other translations. Other translators went back and they looked at this term, episkopos, and they realized that it did not refer to this exalted position that the King James Version translators, of course, many of them coming from a Catholic and later Church of England background, they had bishops in this high and exalted position. And so when they see reference to someone taking the position of an apostle, why not use the term bishop? Because to them, the bishops were the descendants of the apostles. But I really like the way that the New King James Version and the New American Standard Version especially translate this, because what they did, when they recognized that Peter was directly quoting a statement from the Old Testament, they went back to Psalm 109 and verse 8, and they put the exact wording of the verse. They didn't change any of the wording. They didn't change any of the references. They put the exact wording of the passage that was being quoted. And folks, by my estimation, in my opinion, I think that's the most honest way to handle this. Whenever you are directly quoting a statement from the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it stands to reason that you would quote the exact words that were being used. You wouldn't change that up. And so ultimately what you find is that in these other translations, they word this, that, um, that Judas took the position, he took the office, one translation, he took the overseership, 
which this term episkopos just literally means overseer. And so these were all terms that were better representations of what we see being set forth rather than this term bishopric. But now let's, let's come down into verses 21 and 22. We're going to look at these together because what we find in these two verses are the qualifications of an apostle. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So in these two verses, we find three qualifications. These three qualifications are being set forth by divine mandate in order for someone to serve in the position of an apostle. They have to meet three qualifications. First, they have to be a man. Second, they had to have accompanied the other apostles, these other 11 men. They had to have accompanied them throughout the ministry of Jesus. Notice it says that they had to have been there from the beginning during the time of the baptism of John all the way through the ministry of Jesus. They had to have seen Jesus after he rose from the dead and they had to have still been there faithful at this point. So these were people who, no, they weren't necessarily in that inner circle of those 12 men that were initially chosen, but these had to have been men that were there all along, following along. But then three, they had to have been a witness of the resurrection. They had to have seen Jesus alive after he rose from the dead. Now, there are certain religious groups today that claim that men can still be apostles today. One of the prominent ones that we see is the Mormon church. The Mormon church is led by what they call the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And what they believe is that these 12 apostles, kind of what we saw when I was talking about with the bishops, you know, the Catholic Church believes that the bishops are, that their authority has been passed down from the apostles to this day. Well, the Mormon Church believes the same thing, that there have always been 12 apostles, that from the time that the initial 12 were chosen to the time that Matthias took Judas' place, they say that, well, then, when James was put to death, that Paul came along and took his place. And they go through the Bible, and they say, well, and then you can look at certain people like Barnabas and Timothy and Titus, and they say, well, these are all individuals that stepped up to take the positions of apostles as the apostles died. Folks, there is nothing, nothing in the Bible that indicates any of this. There is nothing in religious history or secular history that indicates any of this. And what the Mormon church teaches is that there are always 12 and never more than 12 because that authority was given only to 12 men and therefore only 12 people at a time can hold that position. But something I found very interesting was a few years back, a man by the name of Gordon Hinckley. Gordon Hinckley was the, the president of the Mormon church for many years. And he made this statement. He said, no other Christian church has this same view of apostles. So going back, tracing all the way back through history, he says, no one other than the Mormons believe it this way. No one else sees it this way. Well, that right there should throw up a red flag. I said, no one else has this kind of interpretation. Well, some Pentecostal groups will refer to their missionaries as apostles. They believe that since the Latin translation of this Greek term episkopos is the Latin term missio, M-I-S-S-I-O, they say, well, this is talking about evangelism. It's talking about mission work. Therefore, as we send people out to evangelize, then we will baptize them and ordain them as apostles. And so among certain Pentecostal groups, you see this term apostle being used. An example of this, and, and of course this is a very 
uh, very worldly, very secular use of this. But some of you may remember back in 1997, there was a movie that came out. Uh, Robert Duvall starred in this movie, and it was called The Apostle. And in this movie, he wanted to start. Uh, he wanted to start a Pentecostal church. And so he went out, and there's one scene in that movie where he goes out to the river. He baptizes himself, and as he comes forth from the water, he says, I now have baptized myself an apostle. And from that point forward, he's referred to as the apostle. Well, that's what this is coming from. This, this belief that because the Latin translation is this term missio, that missionaries can rightfully be referred to as apostles. Uh, there's some groups within the Catholic Church that will still use this term apostle to refer to certain ones of their leaders, and we see that there are several of the African American denominations out there that will refer to some of their leaders as apostles. But when you go back and you look at the qualifications that Peter set forth, remember what they were? Had to be a man, had to have been a follower of Christ from the time of the baptism of John through the period of the resurrection and was still faithful at the time of the ascension and had to have actually witnessed the resurrected Christ. Is there anyone on earth today that fits all of those qualifications? That's right. It would be very old if they do. But there's no one today that fits those qualifications because the office of an apostle was intended to be a temporary position. And it was one that was intended to pass away along with the deaths of these apostles. The twelve, followed by Matthias being added, and then Paul. At the time of their death, John being the last one, we talked about this a lot when we studied Revelation, John being the last apostle living, when John breathed his last, the office of an apostle came to an end. It had been fulfilled. There was no longer a need for that position. But others have claimed that those who the apostles laid their hands on also became apostles. We have some of our brethren that make this argument, and, and granted, uh, they do make some pretty strong arguments in this regard. But what they say is that when the apostles laid hands upon someone, that that conferred the position or the authority of an apostle onto that person as well. And therefore, the position of an apostle continued until that generation of people passed away. Well, we know that's not true. Because the apostles had the ability to lay hands on people and extend a portion of authority to them. They had the ability to confer limited miraculous spiritual gifts upon them. But we find that only these apostles had received the full outpouring of the Spirit. And so the position of apostles, like I said, there are some that have made the claim that people like Barnabas, that Timothy, Titus, uh, Silas, Gaius, some of these others that are described in the New Testament as being just exceptionally strong, faithful Christians, that these men became apostles. But there's nothing that would indicate that. There's nothing whatsoever that indicates that anyone other than the initial 12, followed by Matthias and followed by Paul, were ever given the position of an apostle. So we're going to stop right there, and I think that's a, a good place for us to stop. And we'll pick up next Sunday in verses 24 and 25.